Don't stop me now, I'm having such a good time, I'm having a ball. Don't stop me now, until we hit the Calamite on Planet Fall, because he crashed it a lot, didn't he? Tom Paris. Today, we are breaking down another community suggestion, this one coming from GameFox. Thank you very much. And whilst it had a brief mention in our USS Voyager breakdown, check it out, by the way, grab some coffee, this is a long one. It's fully dedicated to the 24th century warp-powered, ultra-responsive hot rod. We are not designing a hot rod, Lieutenant. Welcome to Trek Central, Lords, Ladies, and Sovereigns. I'm your host, Lieutenant Commander Adam, and don't bother inviting me to a karaoke night. You'll regret it. Before we warp into the video, as always, if you want to keep up with the latest news, lore, and more on the Star Trek universe, then make sure that you hit that subscribe button and never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media for daily updates on the Star Trek universe, and as always, please let us know your thoughts in the comments, because if you're talking about Star Trek, not only do we want to hear about it, but it may end up being made into a video. Just like this one! Anyway, engage! We're talking about the Delta Flyer, you know, in case the video wasn't completely obvious in that regard. It was built in 2375, and then again in 2377, not only to give the Voyager crew an all-round coverage of Delta Quadrant-inspired components, weaponry, and etc., but it was made to further supplement their never-ending, yet somehow ever-diminishing supply of standard Starfleet issue shuttles. The main proponent, Tom Paris, who repeatedly championed the idea for a specialized shuttlecraft, said Class 2s just didn't cut it in the Delta Quadrant anymore. If at all, really. And they needed something bigger and better since they got there. And we're going to pause right here because I can already hear the pedants among you go, But what about the Aero Shuttle? We'll get to that! Despite Commander Pessimist, oh, sorry, call him by his proper name, uh, no, Chicote, reminding him of how many times he doesn't remember them going over it, they just didn't have time to design and build a new ship from scratch. Why didn't they finish the Aero Shuttle then? Oh, f Tom stepped up with a head start on the design aspect. All they needed to do was replicate the alloys, use spare parts from <laughs> storage, working around the clock, seven of nine foregoing regeneration for the duration of the project, and why is he still Ensign Harry Kim, putting in as much overtime as it takes? Because of course he did they'd have it up and running inside of a week. In any other industry in the world, you would say that's a foolish brag indeed, but this isn't Microsoft, it's Starfleet. So naturally, it went perfectly fine. <clears throat> Tom's vision for the flyer came in at 21 meters in length with ultra aerodynamic contours, retractable nacelles, parametallic hull plating, unimatrix shielding based on Tuvok's brilliant design for the multispatial probe, which incidentally prompted the need for the project to get off the ground in the first place, and a Borg-inspired weapon system including four and aft phaser strips and a micro torpedo launcher equipped with photonic missiles. It's not really very Borg. And of course, we had to have the obligatory Treknobabble laced input from Harry as well, using isomagnetic EBS conduits in the plasma manifold, maximizing the power distribution. Try to say that 17 times fast without tripping over your lip. That is perhaps the most illogical statement you've ever made. Equipped with a circumferential warp reaction chamber, capable of atmospheric flight and landing on the surface of planets. You know, um, these days it's not being crashed into said planets. I stand by the Delta Flyer being Trek's equivalent of Red Dwarf Starbug. Although, given how many times Starbug crashed, fell apart, smacked into things, yeah, it probably already was. An implementation added not too long after the construction of the flyer were modifications to its thrusters and immersion shielding, which gave the ship the ability to operate deep within the Monean Ocean planet. The standard complement of four crew with a minimum occupancy of one pilot that could operate most ship systems from the helm. Fun fact, by the way, the most noticeable difference between Tom's initial designs and the finished product were the nacelles. His system display showed the entire nacelle housing extending outward and backward, whereas the finished ship simply had what appeared to be the warp coils and Bussard collectors slipping downward a little bit. Though it could be argued that during the building process, the latter proved more efficient, of course, so there you go, there's an in-universe reason too. Torres' suggestion for titanium alloys for the hull, whereas Seven recommended tetraburnium instead, due to its higher structural integrity characteristics. That said, the pressures of the gas giant caused microfractures along the hull within minutes anyway, so that particular problem was never resolved, but they weren't in a hurry to do that kind of stunt again. Anchors away. Put 
Putting aside my terrible humor and all the Trekno babble for a moment, let's take a look at what prompted the need for the new shuttle in the first place. It was, very simply, to rescue a multi-spatial probe, a very special one. It was initially caught by a Malon freighter two hours away at maximum warp, and the crew of Voyager were able to remotely free the probe from the Malon and deemed it a good idea to play hide-and-seek in a Class 6 gas giant, 10 kilometers below the outer atmosphere. Transporters were out of the question, and boosting their range wasn't possible. So, Tom, again, suggested simply flying in and grabbing it. Tuvok quipped that he wasn't paying attention when the Malon freighter imploded that attempted to do so. But not only was the flyer capable of standing up to a number of hostile environmental situations, to which it showed its resilience time and again, uh, mostly, such as the crushing pressures of gas giants, ocean planets, much more. It also withstood subspace distortions inside a graviton ellipse, when retrieving the Ares IV, an early Mars mission spacecraft. The Delta Flyer was used also as an early warning system, flying ahead of Voyager while in slipstream, detecting phase variances in the stream and relaying them to Seven of Nine at operations to make corrections. In a very, very cruel alternate timeline, Harry miscalculated and Voyager was destroyed, while he and Chakotay carried on home. With 10 years of work under his belt, a stolen Delta Flyer, a rescued EMH, and Seven of Nine's head, vital ingredients for a space age picnic, Harry Kim had a new set of phase corrections ready to send Voyager. Though, predictably, they didn't work. He was, however, able to shut down the drive entirely and at least save the crew. Alas, that iteration of the flyer was destroyed following a brief phaser fight with Captain LaForge's USS Challenger and a core breach as a result of breaking free of the tractor beam and overloading their EPS conduits. Whoops. Needless to say, the flyer became the mainstay of the shuttle bay, for those missions that didn't require a full crew complement, but a sufficient group to keep the B-plot of the episode more interesting than what's happening on the mothership. Looking at you, once upon a time. With all of its Borg components, as made more evident by the green glowy hull sections, another modification was made to her shields to creep up on a damaged Borg sphere, undetected, to retrieve a transwarp coil. It looks exactly like the crappy old tire that you keep under the carpet in the boot of your car. The coil itself was installed on the flyer for it to reach transwarp velocity, obviously, to rescue Seven of Nine previously captured by, you guessed it, the Borg. Just two years after being built, Surviving insurmountable odds, the tough little ship, not that one, finally met its match at the hands of, guess what? The Borg! <laughs> a Borg tactical cube, no less, during a raid mission to liberate the drones of Unimatrix Zero. Though, to be fair to the resilience, it took four shots, four direct hits from a tactical cube. That's more than you would expect for something so ickle. Delta Flyer 2.0 was quickly built from the retrieved wreckage of a couple of thousand pieces, and the first mission it is taken on is to a Borg debris field to retrieve a cortical node for Seven of Nine. They were quickly happened upon by some pirates, which with some swishy, slippery flying by lizard parents Tom and Janeway, were finally left in the dust, allowing those two to leave the field unscathed. Though Tuvok, the head of security, got shot but you could easily argue that that is, after all, his job. So mission accomplished. Several systems were also upgraded over the original design in Delta Flyer 2, such as the weapons, including pulse-phased weapons now, and the hull was further reinforced with duranium. Another feature were deployable impulse thrusters, as shown off in the Transstellar Rally that was entered into, which gave it a sizable boost to the overall maximum impulse speed and absolutely ignoring the effects of relative time distortion. Because yes, the flyer was used in Voyager's first official Starfleet mission in seven years too, finding the lost Friendship One probe. Launched centuries earlier as a means of telling humanity's mission to explore strange new worlds, seeking out new life and new civilizations, boldly going where no one has gone before, and irradiating them. What? That's what happened. There are no design sketches suggesting that the dynamatic tail fins were ever part of an alternate pitch. Just Tom Paris wanting something cool. Star Trek Voyager's resident illustrator Rick Sternbach explained in his thinking behind his design for the creation of the Delta Flyer that he began with a series of doodles, which helped crystallize his thoughts as he focused on the design for the brief. The Delta Flyer began its life as a Season 5 concept for an all-environmental shuttle capable of deep space missions, atmospheric flight, 
planetary crash, and or landings, I suppose, and life in the hostile Delta Quadrant. It should be the little ship that could. The whole design process began in June of 1998, with the usual pages upon pages of doodles. The brief for Extreme Risk explained that it would be a four-crew cockpit, with an offset helm at the front, a departure from the tandem stations of previous shuttles and runabouts. The window frames were determined by the cockpit set design, and if you look, they line up with the three forward-facing stations. Various simple shapes went through the works that Sternbach thought would be plausible extensions of Starfleet hardware, from familiar wedges to streamlined darts. A few of them even looked like miniature voyagers, others like larger versions of existing shuttles, some even echoing runabouts and the Defiance shuttle, Chaffee. Ideas were scribbled down as they came to him, even if they didn't get included in the final design, because one never knows when some great little shape or tetchy idea will be useful later on. Even in the preliminary sketches, questions arose such as warp pods or not, where to put the navigational deflector, phasers, RCS thrusters, how do you even get in the thing? Dan Curry took a shine to a particularly pointy hull concept and asked Rick to develop it further. The original design became more of a solid mass, onto which details such as impulse nozzles, blended warp pods in the wings, an entry hatch, thank goodness, facade collectors and phasers were finally added. The first few passes saw some rather heavy Klingon shield plating eliminated, as far too many Borg enhancements toned down to just a few but still nicely visible. A nose-mounted torpedo launcher was moved underneath, and two pulse phaser cannons were scratched. Other modifications were made on the fly using the CG and foam core builds, such as hull parts that were difficult to convey in blueprints. The addition of the familiar warp field grill and the relocation of the wing-mounted phaser strips were also made at this point. In the areas of lighting and articulation, such as extendable landing pads, speed brakes, hatches and the warp pods, suggestions were given to visual effects and passed on to foundation imaging. Two years after its initial inception, the ship was still being worked on, making additions and modifications to the two sets and the CGI model. The life pods, whilst fun to invent, were difficult to place, and they added to a well-known thorny problem, a TARDIS kind of problem. The Delta Flyer appeared appreciably larger on the inside than the outside. That is a first. The aft compartment was being cooked up separately by set designer Richard James, and there weren't really any indications of entry points for the life pods, which necessitated a recalculation of the dimensions for the actual Delta Flyer from 15 meters, 49 feet, to 21 meters, 69 feet. Similarly, when the lab compartment was built into the aft for Timeless, it was a real challenge to fit everything into the conceptual space. Technically, the chamber where Seven was stored, then presumably discarded, would stick out into space, while the revised dimensions meant that the wingtips just cleared the shuttle bay opening. The CG model was down to Rob Bonchu. He was determined to meticulously follow the blueprints that Rick had drawn up, so he could look at it and say, that's exactly what I drew. He didn't want one iota of difference between the reference material and the finished model. So what ship would you like us to break down next? Let us know, we'll do our very best to deliver it to you. If you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then again, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media or join our community Discord server. For now, I've been Lieutenant Commander Adam. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends.